Chapter 2 Emily Moore made no move to get out of the car as Bill Hapgood pulled up in front of the sprawling house his thrice-great-grandfather had begun building as a farmhouse in the early part of the nineteenth century. Originally nothing more than a cabin built at the edge of the first small field that Luther Hapgood had carved out of the forest surrounding the hamlet of Granite Falls in the early part of the nineteenth century, the house had been remodeled and expanded, as had the farm, by the next three generations of Hapgoods. Its architecture was vaguely federal, but with so many bastardizations that it was nearly impossible to assign it to any particular style. Eclectic was how either one of the agents in Bill Hapgood's real estate business would have described it, though Bill himself refused to label his home. It's just what the family wanted, was all he said if anyone happened to ask how the house had come to be. No one in Granite Falls, of course, would ever ask. Everyone in town not only knew Hapgood Farm, but knew its history as well. Emily Moore, though, was now staring suspiciously at the rambling, ungainly brick edifice, as if she'd never seen it before. "'Is this a hospital?' she asked, her voice trembling with sudden fear. "'I'm not sick. I don't need a hospital.' "'It's not a hospital, mother,' Joan replied. Her frustration with her mother, which had boiled over a few minutes ago, was back under control, and as she opened the rear door of the Range Rover to help Emily out, she explained what was happening once again. It's our house, mother. You remember it. You've been here hundreds of times. I don't want to go to your house, Emily fretted. Take me home. You can't stay at your house, Graham, Matt said, reaching in to take his grandmother's hand. There was a fire, remember? Emily's eyes clouded, and she pulled her hand away from Matt. Of course I remember, she muttered. Joan did it. Mom wasn't even there, Matt began, but his mother didn't let him finish. It was an accident, mother she said, knowing better than to argue with the old woman right now. And I'm sure the damage isn't too bad. I'll get you settled in. Then Matt and I will go get whatever you need. Her eyes filled with suspicion. Emily reluctantly let herself be guided into the house and up the wide staircase to the second floor. Joan opened the door to a spacious guest room in the southeast corner and drew her mother inside. Isn't this lovely? You'll have sun all morning and most of the afternoon, too. Emily peered around the room. The walls were papered with a bright floral pattern on a pale yellow background, with curtains and a bedspread to match. Besides the bed, night table, and dresser, there were a pair of wing-back chairs flanking a small fireplace, and a door leading to a bathroom that was shared with another guest room. Emily ran a finger over the small occasional table that stood next to one of the wing chairs. She scowled disapprovingly at the dust she saw on her finger. "'I'll dust it in a little while, Mother. Would you like to take a nap?' Clearly not yet certain where she was, Emily eyed her daughter suspiciously. "'Why do you want me to go to sleep?' she demanded. "'What are you going to do to me?' "'It's the sickness,' Joan reminded herself. "'It's just the sickness, and it doesn't mean anything.' She silently repeated once more what Dr. Henderson had explained to her when Emily's Alzheimer's had first been diagnosed. "'There will be times when she's angry about everything, and times when she gets paranoid.' But for a while, at least, there will also be times when she's just like her old self, and you'll think she's actually getting better. But there's no way of reversing her condition. And in the long run, she's only going to get worse. You just have to try to be patient with her. And remember that she doesn't always even understand what she's saying, let alone mean anything by it. And as the illness progressed, Joan had managed to deal with it. She'd learned to ignore the criticism her mother heaped on her. She tried to keep her patience as she explained to her mother again and again that Cynthia would not be coming home. But Cynthia's death was only one of the things she had to explain over and over again. For as the months of Emily's illness turned into years, and the fog of the disease clouded more and more of her mind, Joan found herself having to repeat almost everything over and over again. Twice recently, Emily had failed to recognize Bill when they stopped by to bring her groceries. And last week, she hadn't been sure who Matt was. But perhaps that would change, now that she was going to be living in the same house with her son-in-law and her grandson. Maybe if she saw them every day, she'd remember who they were. Except that Dr. Henderson had also explained to her that as the disease progressed, it would become nearly impossible for Emily to assimilate anything new. Joan pushed the thought away. Somehow it would work. She would make it work. Because if her mother couldn't adjust to living here, then there was only one alternative. She would have to do what her mother had been accusing her of wanting to do for years. She would have to find a nursing home. 
Her mother would never forgive her for that. But worse, Joan would never forgive herself for it. No matter how bad Emily's condition got, her mother was still her mother, and it was her duty to take care of her. Once again, in firm control of her roiling emotions, Joan put a gentle arm around her mother's stooped and rounded shoulders and tried to ease her toward a chair. I'm not going to do anything to you, she soothed. I'm just going to take care of you, that's all. You'll see. Everything is going to be fine. You'll like it here. Emily's mouth worked as if she were about to say something, but finally she sank into the chair. Her eyes darted around the room as if searching for a hidden enemy, and then she rubbed her arms, shivering despite the warmth of the room. Would you like me to light the fire? Joan offered. For a moment Emily seemed not to have heard her at all, but then she looked up and her eyes fixed on her daughter. Joan could see the unreasoning anger of the disease start to burn in her mother's eyes and braced herself against whatever her mother was about to say. When Emily finally spoke, she confirmed Joan's fears. Isn't it bad enough that you tried to burn me up in my own house? Joan flinched not only at the words but at the bitterness in her mother's voice, but forced herself to turn away from the pain they caused, telling herself once again that it was the disease talking, not her mother. I'll put on a pot of tea, she said. You've always loved tea. It will make you feel better. As Joan started from the room, she braced herself for whatever parting words her mother might have for her, but Emily said nothing more. The eye of the storm, Joan thought. I feel like I'm in the eye of the storm. And she knew that no matter which way she turned, the storm lay dead ahead. Though Joan knew she was driving far more slowly than safety might demand, she made no effort at all to accelerate the Range Rover along the winding mile that separated Hapgood Farm from Granite Falls, ignoring Matt's groans as half a dozen honking cars raced past them. The last traces of the pleasure she'd taken in the perfect autumn morning had gone up in the smoke of the fire, and the forest, which only a few hours ago had beckoned to her to spend the weekend basking in its splendor, now appeared to be closing around her, suffocating her. As she rounded the last curve and the town itself came into view, she slowed even more, her eyes fixed for a moment on the sign announcing that the town had been founded in 1684, and she remembered her third-grade teacher, Miss Rutherford, who had died just last year, explaining to her class that Granite Falls had begun as a fur-trapping outpost. It grew slowly over the centuries, retaining the tidy orderliness of so many small New England towns, sufficient unto itself, and far enough from any major city that it never became inundated with weekenders and summer people. She crossed the bridge over Granite Creek, which wound along the western edge of the town before meandering south through a corner of Hapgood Farm on its way to drain into the Merrimack River, a dozen miles southeast. As Joan turned onto Prospect Street and drove by the high school, as unchanged in the last century as everything else in Granite Falls, she found herself wondering once again why her parents had come here in the first place. All she really knew was that it had happened before either she or Cynthia were born and that after her father left, when she was still too young to remember him, her mother had stayed. Even before the disease had robbed her of her memory, Emily Moore had steadfastly refused to talk about why her husband had left. As for why she herself had stayed in a town where almost everyone else had roots that went back generations, Emily only shrugged her thin shoulders. There was a job here, she said. What was I supposed to do? I had two children to raise. I couldn't leave. A trap. Joan thought now, her grip tightening on the steering wheel as she pulled around the corner onto Burlington Avenue. The whole town is a trap. Mother sounded just as trapped back then as I feel now. And today she looks like a trapped animal. Another thought came to mind. Had the animals for whose hides the town had been built felt the same fear when the traps closed on them? But even as the idea came to her, Joan rejected it. It'll be all right, she told herself. Whatever happens with Mother... I'll get through it, just like I've always gotten through things. She braked the Range Rover to a stop in front of the house in which she'd grown up. The crowd, its enthusiasm for the fire quenched along with the flames themselves, had all but disappeared, though Ralph Gunderson was still chatting in his front yard with Phyllis Adams, who had come over from her house across the street. As soon as Joan saw the disapproving look on Phyllis's face, she knew what her mother's neighbors had been talking about. Phyllis confirmed it. It's such a shame, isn't it? Of course we've all known Emily shouldn't have been living alone, haven't we? Joan tried to ignore the sting of Phyllis's words. 
As late as yesterday afternoon, her mother had refused even to discuss the possibility of leaving her little house on Burlington Avenue, let alone allow someone to come in and care for her. But Joan knew that all Phyllis and her friends would remember was that she'd left her mother alone and the house had caught fire. She offered Phyllis a smile that feigned more warmth than she felt. "'You know my mother,' she replied. "'She's always been independent, and obviously she was able to get help before the fire got out of control.' Phyllis smiled thinly. "'I suppose God looks out for those who have no one else.' Her eyes bored into Joan's. "'Will you be putting her somewhere?' "'She'll be with us.' Joan replied, at least for a while. The other woman's expression hardened. Well, at least you and Bill are in a position to be able to do what you want. So there it is, Joan thought. Leave it to Phyllis to assume that enough money can solve everything. But instead of rising to the bait, she reminded herself that Phyllis had undoubtedly been drinking most of the afternoon, and was now probably feeling even more sorry for herself than she did when she was sober. Joan made herself smile again. I'm just glad we can take her in, she replied evenly. Before Phyllis could say anything else, Joan mounted the steps leading to her mother's front door and went into the house, with Matt right behind her. What's with Mrs. Adams? her son asked. Why is she mad at you? Or is she already drunk? I think she's just mad at the world, Joan replied, answering Matt's first question but ignoring his second. She resents anyone who she thinks is a little better off than she is. Her nostrils filled with the acrid smell of smoke as she quickly scanned the living room and dining room of the little house. Though everything looked exactly as it always had, the house somehow felt different. The fire, she thought. It's just the smell of the fire. But it was more than that. For as she closed the front door behind her and moved farther into the house, the strange sensation grew stronger. Behind her, Matt echoed the feelings she hadn't yet voiced. This is weird. It's like the house knows Graham's not coming back. As Joan's eyes took in the living room, its tables covered with the cheap china figurines her mother had been collecting since she and Cynthia had been children, Matt once again gave voice to what she was thinking. What are we going to do with all her stuff? Move it into our house? Joan heard a note of anxiety in his voice, and her mind went back ten years to the time when she and Matt had been living here in this house, before she married Bill Hapgood. She could still remember her mother chiding Matt as his small fingers reached out to the china collie dog that lay on the floor under the end table. Don't touch that, she'd said. That's very valuable and not for children. Matt jerked his hand away as quickly as if he'd touched a hot stove, and her mother had turned on Joan herself. Can't you control your brat? If you didn't know how to raise him, you shouldn't have had him in the first place. Even years later, the words still stung her, and though she hoped that Matt had blocked them from his own memory... The way he was staring at the porcelain dog told her that he had not. "'I suppose we'll have to take some of it,' Joan said, already dreading the task of sorting through the scores of figurines her mother had crammed into the house over the years. Nor would it matter how careful she was, or how hard she tried to choose her mother's favorites. Whatever she did, it would be wrong. "'But we won't take any of them right now,' she decided. "'We'll just get a few of her clothes, and I'll bring her over tomorrow to start going through everything.' Matt's gaze shifted from the collie to his mother. Graham's going to live with us from now on, isn't she? Despite the inflection at the end of the sentence, Joan knew it wasn't a question. He was asking for confirmation of what he already knew. I don't see what else we can do, she said gently. I know she's difficult, and I know... She hesitated, but knew there was no need to cushion Matt from the truth. After all, they'd both lived with his grandmother through four of the first five years of his life after Joan had finally faced the fact that she couldn't raise him by herself in New York City. Matt, I'm sorry. I know how she treats you, but what else can I do? She's still my mother. Jeez, Mom, it's not just me. Look how she treats you. It's like you can't ever do anything right, no matter how hard you try. I know, Joan sighed, but it still doesn't change the fact that she's my mother, and I have to take care of her as long as I can. I can't just... She cast around in her mind, searching for the right words, but could find none better than the ones her mother always used. I just can't bring myself to throw her in the home. Matt took a deep breath, then slowly let it out in a sigh of resignation. I guess, he agreed, and Joan could see how much effort it took for him to even give her that. But then he brightened. 
Hey, who knows? Maybe she'll be better when she gets out of here. Let's go up and get whatever she's going to need and go home. He wrinkled his nose against the acrid smell of the fire that hung heavy in the house. This place smells even worse than ever. But as they started up the stairs, Matt's steps slowed, and when they came to the landing, he paused, gazing through the open door to the room that had belonged to the aunt he'd never known. She's not going to make us move Aunt Cynthia's stuff, too, is she? Joan hesitated at the door to her sister's room, then stepped through it, and suddenly she heard her mother's voice again. Get out! That's Cynthia's room, and those are Cynthia's things, and no one is to touch them. No one! And keep your bastard brat out of there, too. As the echo of the words slowly faded away in her mind, Joan shook her head. No, she told Matt. She can't ask us to do that. She smiled at her son and offered him a conspiratorial wink. After all, we can't move what we can't touch, can we? But even as she spoke the words, her mother's voice rang in her mind once more. This time she recalled the day when Matt was three, and she had suggested to her mother that he was old enough to have his own room. Cynthia's room? You want me to give your sister's room, your little brat? <laughs> Never! As long as I'm alive, I'll keep your sister's room ready. When she comes home to me, all her things will be waiting for her. All of them! Joan, eyes glistening with tears, had said nothing, knowing it was useless to argue with her mother. Now she reached out and pulled the door to Cynthia's room closed, hoping that by blocking the view of her sister's room, she could also block the pain of her mother's words. She didn't mean it, Joan told herself. She was already starting to get sick, and she didn't know what she was saying. Come on, let's pack up what she's going to need and get out of here, she said to Matt, unconsciously repeating the same words he'd spoken a few moments before. It seemed nothing could thaw the icy chill that had settled over the Hapgood's dining room. Not the fire that Matt had laid in the hearth, nor the dozens of candles Joan had lit to cast a warm glow over the family's dinner. Though she'd cut the last of the fall flowers and set the table with a set of limoges that had been given to Bill's grandmother as a wedding present from the Vanderbilts, and though she'd carefully prepared only the things she knew her mother liked, nothing had gone as Joan planned. She felt a faint flicker of hope when she first let her mother into the room. Emily stopped short when she stepped through the dining room doors, her eyes moving through the room, lingering on the gleaming silver and crystal that shimmered in the flickering candlelight. It's going to be all right, Joan had told herself. But then Emily said, How could you light all those candles? Don't you even care about what happened? I was just trying to make it nice for you, Mother, Joan ventured as she helped the old woman into the chair opposite Matt. Why bother? You know you don't want me here. Emily peered balefully at her son-in-law and grandson. And I don't want to be here. Joan did her best to keep a conversation going, but no matter what she said, her mother either ignored her, disagreed with her, or changed the subject. Emily glowered at the plate of food Joan set in front of her, and after objecting that she'd been served far too much, asked if the chicken was spoiled. Nobody could eat this, she declared. It's good, Graham, Matt said. It's rotten. Emily said, pushing her plate away. Take me home. Joan silently appealed to her husband. You are home, Mother Moore, Bill said. Seeing Emily's eyes flash, she quickly added, At least for a while, until we can decide what would be best for you. It was as if Emily hadn't heard him. Where's Cynthia? she asked. Why isn't she here? I want Cynthia. She stood up, pushing her chair back from the table so abruptly that it fell over. As Joan and Bill leaped up to help her, she brushed them aside. Leave me alone. I'm going to find Cynthia. Emily left the dining room and Joan started after her, but Bill caught her arm. Let her go, he said. But she doesn't know what she's doing, Joan protested. She barely even knows her way around. Matt can keep an eye on her, Bill replied. Then to his son. Don't try to argue with her, Matt, and don't try to make her do anything. Just keep an eye on her and don't let her hurt herself, okay? Only when Matt was gone and he closed the dining room door did Bill speak to his wife again. This isn't going to work, he said gently. I can make it work, Joan began. All she needs is a few days and she'll know her way. Bill held up a hand to cut the flow of his wife's words. She won't know anything and she won't get better. His voice took on a slight edge. You know she won't, Joan. Every doctor we've talked to for the past two years has told you she'll only get worse. He hesitated, then pressed on. 
we have to find a place for her, a place where they can take care of her. Joan shook her head. Bill, she's my mother. And when all this started, when she first got sick, I promised that no matter what happened, I'd never put her into a nursing home. I promised I'd take care of her myself. I can't just put her away. It wouldn't be putting her away. It wouldn't be anything like that. We'll find the best place in the area. We can hire around-the-clock care if you want, and you'll be able to visit her every day. Joan shook her head. I can't, she repeated, her voice trembling. I promised her. She's my... Again, Bill cut her off. And when he spoke this time, the edge in his voice had sharpened. I know she's your mother, but I also know how she treats you. Most of the time she has no idea who I am. And as for Matt... I know, Joan said, breaking again before he could finish his indictment. But what am I supposed to do? Could you have broken a promise you made to your father? As Joan's tears overflowed, Bill put his arms around her. I know, he said. I know how hard it is. But if she stays here, she'll tear this family apart. I know it. He looked deep into her eyes. And you know it, too. Joan didn't answer. But to Bill, the conflicting emotions that struggled within her were written clearly on her face. And finally he held her close. A week, he conceded. We'll give it a week. They stood together, their arms wrapped around each other, each of them reflecting upon the words Bill had just spoken. In a week, Bill thought, I can find the best nursing home in the Northeast and do whatever it takes to get her admitted. In a week, Joan thought, she'll be used to the house and recognize Bill and everything will be all right.